coming to Los Angeles uh, turned out to be uh, a really good move for the show generally because uh, it provided us with so many new resources. Uh, the, one of the hard things was, and one of the uh, things I was most apprehensive about was the putting together of a new crew. We, we had such a winning team in Vancouver. I never thought we'd be able to replace the Vancouver crew, but we did, and we did so beautifully. Uh, Bill Rowe and uh, Jono, our, our gaffer, and Tommy Doherty, our key grip, and the makeup people and the hair people and our script supervisor, every department, props, they came in and filled each hole that we thought was going to be a, a, a leaking dike. They filled each hole beautifully, and they've They've shared in the experience. You know, when people say, well, how can you tell uh, the X-Files has moved to Los Angeles? It's when the, the gunmen are asking for huevos rancheros, por favor. Mas huevos rancheros. You know, that we like sort of bringing in little Spanish ends to our thing. That and, uh, you know, Nell Mulder and Scully driving two cars instead of one. You know, other countries encourage carpooling, whereas here everybody has their own cars. We brought back the character of Gibson Praise, uh, the young chess prodigy, and his ability to communicate his, his alien physiology, if you will, became uh, something that was now uh, not just a danger to him, but uh, a danger to all. Whatever he is, whatever gives him the ability to do what he does, he's your scientific evidence. It's just like we said. He could be the key to everything in the X-Files. In the beginning, that was shocking. There is an call for an alien to be swimming in a nuclear power plant and shed his skin. Thinking, yep, this is a challenge. So we uh, built part of a nuclear reacting plant on our stage, filled it with water, got that alien to go swimming. We have an alien with an alien on top of it, a skin of an alien, and have it dissolve underwater on cue. And actually, we got an actress that we'd worked with several times. I'd worked with her initially on Cocoon when I worked at Greg Hannum's, uh, Wendy Cook, who's like very, very waif-like, very skinny, and had a really unusual physique. And we were lucky enough to get her on the show. And we just did makeups on her with very minimal makeup, just finger extensions, and colored her and airbrushed her to look like the gray alien. And we had one of our guys who's scuba certified, I think Greg Solomon, um, was in there with a squirt gun underwater, actually squirting the pieces of, uh, uh, of the skin off, you know, on cue, uh, which worked surprisingly well. It was great for the crew because they had a lot of different X-Files elements in the beginning to cut their teeth on, to learn how to, to, how to shoot the X-Files. And to their credit, by they did one episode after that uh, with Robbie Bowman uh, called Drive. And by the third episode, which was Triangle, uh, they were an X-Files crew. When Chris first presented the idea of shooting an episode similar to Alfred Hitchcock's rope where there were no noticeable edits, was continuous action. We figured that uh, that would probably change a little bit. It didn't seem really plausible that we would do that. But as Chris brought his vision to everybody else, we started to realize how it could happen. And I said, wouldn't it be great since we have 44 minutes of programming time if uh, we just did an episode where we uh, did uh, one 11 minute take, uh, or four 11 minute takes, and put it all together. And everybody looked at me like I was nuts. What was big for Chris and maybe for me was to have everybody understand that the camera is always moving. And people weren't used to, well, how do we go from scene to scene to scene if the camera's always moving? Well, you pass through a curtain and you use that as a cut. Excuse me. Scully. I suggest you get your Nazi paws off me before you get one in the kisser. No, it's me, Mulder. I had gone to all the actors before, and I said, you have to know your lines. You've got to know them down pat. You've got to, you know, work on them. I go, okay, no problem. The, thanks for calling. And I hung up, and then I thought, wow, does that mean I've screwed up all my lines all those seasons? It's a very nervous-making situation because uh, you blow it, and uh, um, everybody else has to go back to you know their first marks and start all over again. Well, that's not too bad, uh, except when your part's in German. So not only did you have to get everything you would normally have to get right, you had to get it right in German. Wo sind die die Waffen versteckt? No Sprechen. Die Waffen haben Sie an Bord, nicht? I don't speak Nazi. Fortunately, I went to school in Germany for a couple of years, so I, 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 I had a pretty good grasp of, of the language. Dieser Mann ist ein Amerikaner. Es heißt, sie wollen mehr Leute an dem Krieg beteiligen. 
but at one point uh, there was there was a line that I was saying and I didn't understand why I was saying it and, and uh, because it didn't make it didn't make sense in the context of the scene. So I went to Chris and I said, why, why am I saying this? And he said, well, what are you saying? And I told him and he goes, why are you saying that? <laughs> I said, because that's what's in the script. And he goes, that doesn't make any sense. And he, then he told me just to go ahead and make up something that made sense. The second act, which is one long scene that travels through the FBI and ultimately ends up in the FBI parking lot with Scully getting into a Volkswagen van and driving off, uh, there were uh, the, the set decorator and, uh, and the props people were, uh, when the elevator doors would close in that scene, they'd run and they'd, they'd uh, redress the scene. And uh, when the elevator doors would open again, you would never know that they had been there. But in the dailies, you can actually hear them hustling off camera when those doors close and hear the movement uh, as they just barely would make it be before the scene would start again with the opening of the elevator doors. If a guy got punched or something, I'd literally be off camera and jump in as the camera was facing another way and quickly like put a, a slash on him with some blood. And then the camera would come back so it looked like it just started to, you know, bleed. It was really fun. It was like an action makeup thing. <laughs> Dreamland was uh, an attempt once again not to repeat ourselves. And uh, we came up with this idea that was pretty far out, even for the X-Files, a, a body switching episode. And the comedic possibilities were endless. And we realized as we were working it out, John Scheib and Vince Gilligan and I, that we couldn't resolve it all in one hour. And Chris Carter said, make it two hours, which never would have occurred to us because it was, it was a funny episode and we've never done a, a two-part funny episode. It's a classic fish out of water situation. And what's the scariest thing for Agent Mulder to be involved with? The man who has fought fluke worms and, and chased you know, uh, alien craft and, and fought government spies. What's the scariest thing to do with this guy is to put him in a house with a wife and two teenagers. Oh, for God's sake, Morris. A nose ring! She said she wants a nose ring! I hate you! I wish you were dead! Well, my work here is done. Dreamland. That's where uh, Mulder and uh, Michael McKeon change bodies. Will you please stop trying to pick a fight with me? Mulder, you are acting bizarre. Jealous? <laughs> it's always fun to see Mulder's life through the eyes of someone else, too. So when Morris Fletcher sees uh, how Mulder lives, it's somewhat reminiscent of, of Eddie Van Blunt seeing how Mulder lives in uh, Small Potatoes. And yet different because Morris goes out and he makes life better. I mean, he really, uh, he, he does you know, what he thinks uh, Mulder should be doing, which is get a big water bed and, you know, act like he's Hugh Hefner oh, oh. circa 1974. Whoa! Whoa. Uh -oh. <laughs> Mulder. Maybe I like to read the New York Times backwards. The Marx Brothers dance, as far as I know, it's only the third time it's been done in, in film. The Marx Brothers did it in Duck Soup. And then Chico and Lucy did it on the uh, I Love Lucy show. And then I think David and Michael... As far as I know, it's only the third time it's been done. And we hired a choreographer, and we built. Uh, a, that was not. There was no trickery in that. That was the two guys uh, mirroring themselves. Well, they rehearsed it for four or five days, and we built uh, the, the closets. We had the the mirrored frames in, but there was no mirrors in it. It was a double set, so that there was a, two sets. And the guys got that. I think it was take twelve. They got it just almost perfect. Horace, what are you doing? We had been uh, spending a lot of Fox's money uh, in the sixth season. We were learning how to do the show in L.A., and it was expensive and time-consuming, and we kept promising them we were going to do an episode that would uh, save them a lot of money. We were going to do something that took place in one room. And uh, these are always a challenge because you've got to figure out how to uh, tell an X-File, which usually has a lot of movement, a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, procedural quality to it. Uh, you've got to figure out how to stage a scary story in a, a, a confined space. Corey Kaplan, our set designer, built this wonderful, wonderful set in which you're supposed to go from one room into another room, and the, it's the same room, in which was quite a challenge to pull off a room like that. It had uh, bookshelves where the books would fly out, trap doors. It was great fun. Ed Asner and Lily Tomlin uh, really came to the plate on that. This pop psychology approach is crap. All it does is annoy them. 
When's the last time we actually haunted anyone? When was the last time we had a good double murder? Not since the house was condemned. There were a couple of very elaborate effects, uh, and they required um, uh, very precise camera moves, green screen, special makeup. Uh, Ed Asner had a uh, fluorescent orange hole uh, on his head uh, for most of his scene, which was kind of comical in itself. Uh, which would later be turned into a, uh, a visual effect. Uh, Lily Tomlin had the same thing. She had a, uh, a hole placed, I, I think it was orange too, on her nightgown here that would be a special effect. So it looked rather ridiculous in the shooting of it, but I think the effect in the end was terrific. Look at this. We had to do mummified corpses, actually they're here. One of Scully and the one of Mulder back there. We had to do these mummified corpses of them. And for this, we uh, requested the live casts um, that Toby in Canada had originally made of them for, on the show previously for some other effects or makeups that he had done. And uh, from that we made clay replicas of them and actually just, just carved away on their faces. We wanted to retain a subtle amount of their features. It was one of those things where initially in meeting with Chris he wanted them to be initially recognizable as them. Then he wanted them to be kind of a 50-50 thing where when you first saw them you didn't quite recognize them. Oh, Scully. That's us. Then you kind of see, oh yeah, that is them. So we had to have that beat of um, that kind of gap dramatically, which, which to me really worked well from a dramatic standpoint. But from a design standpoint, it made it difficult for us to find that balance where once you knew it was them, you'd recognize it. But if nobody told you, you wouldn't. So that's an example of how, uh, you know, we're treading this fine balance design-wise to accommodate a story function. You ever had one of those days, Scully? Since I've been working here, yeah. The funny thing about Monday is people seem to really like it a lot, but people always sort of smiled and said, well, you're sort of ripping off Groundhog Day, aren't you? With this uh, day that keeps repeating over and over again. And I say, we're not ripping off Groundhog Day, we're ripping off the Twilight Zone. It was kind of a departure for us at the time because it was one of the first, it was sort of a Twilight Zone kind of idea episode, a what if. And we usually, in X-Files, it's usually what's the case. And here's a case that Mulder doesn't even know is a case. He doesn't even know what's going on because he's repeating the same events over and over again. So. It, it was very unusual for us and kind of an experiment, and I thought it came off very well. What an interesting challenge just to, to tell the same story four different times in the same location with the same actors. And I found a way, it came to me very easily too, I was shocked. I found a way to shoot each sequence and give each sequence a different look, and it just worked. We honestly didn't know how to get him out of this loop. We had him in the slip of every day, he walks to a bank, and the bank ends up being destroyed, and Mulder and Scully end up dying somehow. No! We'd already written three quarters of it, and uh, didn't know how we were gonna get out of it. It was a Saturday afternoon, and Vince was doing some rewriting, and I was sitting with Frank in his office, looking at the, the storyboard, covered with cards, except blank ones at the end. How the hell do we get him out of here? And I remember Frank, uh, uh, it's one of those things where you'll, you'll talk about it for days and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and, and then you walk away for five minutes and you come back and somebody has the answer. And Frank turned to me and said, you know, he, he makes himself remember. He's got a bomb, 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 he's got a bomb. And we, you know, we started shooting, I think, that, that the, the day after that, so it was nice to have an ending to the story when the production started. The mythology had gotten so thick and dense and so many conspiracies and betrayals that after a while you can't, the episodes become too talky and too tough. I mean, even the fans are having trouble keeping up with these episodes. My mother's been gone for almost a year. She turns up in a train car where she's been operated on by a group of doctors who were burned alive. I just want the truth. The truth is out there, Agent Spender. Maybe you should find it for yourself. We thought, you know, are we going to carry on with this conspiracy and continue to complicate it? Or are we just going to do something no one expects and go ahead and blow up the conspiracy? And that seemed like the far more interesting path to take. And so what we attempted to do in Two Fathers and One Son was um, answer more questions. And we drew back to the very beginning, to the pilot episode of The X-Files with this alien fetus that had provided genetic material that was crucial to the, to the project. And, and bring it all to an end, which is what we did. We killed off the members of the syndicate and left the cigarette-smoking man with his life's work in ruins. 
this is the story that Chris Owens tells, how he finds out. Because the script came, one son came, with, uh, with a couple pages missing. And those pages were what happens to Agent Spender. So Chris Carter calls Chris Owens, and they're talking on the phone, and he goes, yeah, listen, I don't want you to, you know, be upset or anything, but you get shot in this episode. But they don't find a body, so, you know, you may come back, because that's the beauty of X-Files. Nobody really dies on the X-Files. Yes, you see them shooting and writing names of blood, but it doesn't mean you're dead, per se. I came here hoping otherwise. Hoping that my son might live to honor me. Like Bill Mulder's son. He hangs up the phone and silently, under the door, slips the actual to the one scene where he gets shot. It's just quietly slipped under his door, like the courier was just listening at the door for Chris to tell him before he actually gives him the information. And slightly, it just like shh, shh, and then he just like looks at it and thinks, oh my God, I'm in an X-Files episode. How creepy is this? You can look at the show as pre uh, Two Fathers, One Son, post Two Fathers, One Son, a new conspiracy really uh, developed uh, after the these two episodes and uh, became, while it became its own independent conspiracy, it actually, we see that there was a connection between the two. Why were you with him last night? He called me. I found him in a university stairwell. He could barely speak. He said I was the only one who'd believe him about an artifact. You're a liar. The relationship between Fowley and uh, and Scully is a lot of fun, actually, because clearly Scully doesn't like her, doesn't trust her, feels threatened by her, is definitely threatened by uh, Diana's past with Mulder. Thank you for coming. He was asking for you last night. When he's sick and I'm in his Mulder's apartment, um, you know, the word that I got, because I think at the end of that scene you see me pulling my top off, um, I'm going in for the kill. I received a call from Agent Mulder this evening. He was in a particular state of distress. I don't know why, but I'm staying here until I find out. I actually met a man uh, very early on and during the course of the uh, X-Files. And I told him what I was doing and he told me that he was one of the uh, people responsible for uh, leading the um, uh, US project to map the human genome. And I became very interested in what he, uh, he was telling me and I realized this was exactly what I wanted to uh, do with the show. It was fun for us, particularly working on biogenesis, because we got to approach the whole idea of aliens and humans from a completely different point of view. No longer do we have to deal exclusively with black oil and white-haired men conspiring. We could say, what if there was a spaceship that washed ashore in Africa and uh, this spaceship contained passages from the Bible and the Koran and all these religious texts? What would that mean? No, it would mean nothing, Mulder. No, it would mean that our progenitors were alien, that our genesis was alien, that we're here because of them, that they put us here. So we decided to tie that in with the uh, uh, alien mythology that we had created. And in doing so, I got to do uh, something that uh, I always like to do, which is to uh, talk about science, real science, um, and have Scully talk about it in terms of God and of... Uh, a meaning and of uh, our lives and of our futures. And that is one of the themes that has also developed in the X-Files over the years is the relationship between searching for aliens and searching for God and how in so many ways they're, they're very similar. They ask a lot of the same questions and the answers, um, uh, if, you could, if you could find those answers, they'd have the same kind of profound impact. After all you've done, after all you've uncovered, what more could you possibly hope to do or to find? My sister. Ultimately, we would uh, choose to, uh, in season six, uh, really get rid of the conspiracy and to let the audience, the fans, understand that uh, we were moving into new territory. If we'd been telling one long novel through all the mythology episodes the first six years of the series, this was a 
a chapter in a new book. L.A. just opened up a whole new uh, world for us in terms of locations, uh, looks. What it also provided for us was a tremendous acting pool. Uh, we had used actors on the X-Files you know, five and six, seven times in different parts. And here uh, in Los Angeles, we had you know, the biggest pool of acting talent in the world, probably. Uh, and it was really uh, uh, refreshing to, uh, to see new faces. It, it, I think it gave the show uh, a new look. If we, what we lost in atmosphere, free atmosphere in Vancouver, we gained in uh, um, so many ways in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm.